um, on harnessing theory of flow processes to improve understanding of water available for vegetation, I took the liberty of changing a little bit the language. Um, so uh, I have here uh, Mark Parlange next to me and uh, John Selker. Um, and the idea is to uh, try and, um, and uh, other bring some, uh, identify some key gaps in uh, our understanding of um, the physical side maybe of uh, vegetation life in arid areas um, or other issues that I'll bring up next. But uh, uh, just an announcement and some ground rules. The announcement is that the session, the, uh, the next session will take, out, will take place immediately after this discussion. The good news is that we'll take a 10 minute break, so we'll finish this uh, discussion uh, 10 minutes earlier to allow for some break. Um, the other, uh, the other uh, point of announcement is that uh, uh, we hope that these discussions uh, could be uh, synthesized into some uh, maybe action plans or, or maybe stimulate some uh, other activities. At least uh, at this stage, we want to document them properly. So uh, those of you who are asking questions or answering, uh, please use microphones and uh, speak clearly so it, so it is recorded by the gentleman down there with the video. Uh, for, for purposes of uh, expediency, we'll ask questions to be short. You know, anything more than 30 seconds is really too long. So try to formulate uh, short questions and uh, also try to formulate uh, short answers if possible. I think 60 seconds is probably long enough. Um, uh, one, is there, an, is there another thing I forgot to mention, Tal? No, it's all right. Okay. Uh, so uh, what we thought we'd be doing is that uh, provide uh, a bit of some uh, key hydro-related issues. Okay, now this is not working. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> it works. So um, we tried to identify uh, briefly some of the uh, key hydrological issues uh, that came up in the discussions yesterday and the presentations today as well. Um, we uh, removed some old uh, points that I made before coming to the conference, so they are because they have been already addressed in the very nice session uh, earlier this morning. Uh, I'll try and go over this and uh, put some of my words to these key points and maybe Mark and, uh, and uh, John will join uh, afterwards. So uh, some of the key issues that seems to be um, uh, recurring are the issue of um, the connection between uh, self-organization, uh, resource focusing, and their impact on flux, storage, and of course ultimately on patterns. So how this exactly works, uh, these are uh, quite a bit of uh, knowledge gap there. Um, we understand how perturbation can play a role into uh, initiating or pushing a system one way or the other, but it's not clear how uh, perturbation, both in time and space, propagate in the system. Uh, so pro perturbation and feedbacks, you know, whether it's restraining or, uh, or uh, uh, catastrophic, uh, and uh, with particular aspects of how the hydro, eco, and, eco and climate uh, might play a role. And related to that, uh, we thought that uh, the issue of climate change as a one major perturbation, in fact more than that, uh, might affect uh, uh, functioning of an arid uh, system or semi-arid system, especially in the context of uh, what Paolo did, uh, mentioned yesterday, temperature, rainfall patterns, uh, Simone. Um, the impact of management, grazing, uh, planting, as we saw some activities there, uh, the roles of soil, uh, topography and biota on, uh, on shaping and also triggering uh, uh, transitions. Uh, uh, there is a huge gap in my view, and also Mark mentioned the issue of energy balance, evaporation, and transpiration from patchy environment seems to be quite wide open uh, issue there. Um, and I think the, uh, from the discussions about modeling and uh, experiments and so on, it becomes obvious that uh, there is no clear roadmap of what needs to be measured um, in uh, w metrics and so on that could guide um, uh, ecological mo uh, eco hydrological modeling and uh, whether or not there, there is a desire or there is even a need or is it even possible to develop some framework that will uh, unify or uh, bring together at least large elements of what we'll be discussing or we have discussed 
uh, in terms of uh, arid region uh, eco-hydrological uh, modeling and understanding of the functioning. So these are some of the key issues, but of course this is not an exhaustive list uh, and you're more than welcome to suggest more, but maybe Mark, if you want to add a little bit. Okay. Thanks, Danny. <clears throat> so maybe, um, actually the last talk I think was a good example of where uh, you do very careful uh, experimentation, which will then, you know, can be used to guide how you might want to develop an improved uh, uh, turbulence uh, modeling. And, and I see, you know, when I look at different communities, certainly in the turbulence fluid mechanics community, I, I've seen that the, the role of experiment uh, has really been important in terms of how we guide and how we think about developing our next models. And I was thinking, you know, for the eco-hydrology, I mean, there's some fine examples that we've seen uh, here with the LTER of uh, Mosh or the fingering of Eve or the crusting of Sam or the plant water isotopes of Jeff or Palo's grass and shrub uh, or Tal's hill slopes. Uh, there's more uh, Todd's eddy correlation we'll hear tomorrow or John's optical fiber tomorrow. Um, I think we should somewhere, uh, at least uh, my, my impression was that on the ecological uh, or hydrological modeling uh, that we could... Uh, uh, make use of these experiments to to do a, a bit what Ignacio was asking yesterday, which was you know to guide how we're going to ask uh, the questions, and then that in turn asks you know what are the next measurements, what is the next uh, new instrumentation we really need to develop, and what is the next uh, modeling that we want to use. So somehow I, I think we have to, as a community, go back you know continue to our roots the, the importance of the measurements. And I think Sam, you know your examples from the measurements from the 30s or wherever. You know, those I think were extremely important then in terms of guiding uh, later modeling efforts. Yeah, um, well, we will, we will talk more about uh, some experimental methods tomorrow. Um, and I think that, you know, the, 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 if you look at the official title of our roundtable, it's, you know, it's theoretical frameworks, you know, for, for soil water. Um, and yet we saw that fundamental uh, advances um, are being made for instance, let's look at Jeff's work about the, the discussion that ensued thereafter with respect to the, the importance of, of interfaces in the, in the system and how those interfaces take on the geometry they have. And so um, I think that uh, echoing much of what Danny and Mark said, uh, my impression is that it's really essential to keep um, the, the, the force moving towards greater field measurements. And I think that's a huge opportunity for our, for our community because, you know, we're getting back into the field. I think it is, when we say eco-hydrology, the complexity is sufficient that you, the, the only way you're really going to get data that will um, validate or invalidate some of the basic concepts um, locally, of course, is through field data. And um, one of the examples that I won't talk about tomorrow but I think is interesting uh, in, in Chile, for example, I mean, if I asked you, you know, okay, basic theory of soils, I said, does soil hydraulic conductivity, you know, if you take K as a function of theta, you know, does it go up with theta or does it go down with theta, right? So it's a reason, you know, reasonable question, and, and, and the theory is pretty well, you know, set up in that area. But, of course, if you stand out in the middle of a field in a rainstorm, and you, 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 know, uh, you may notice sometimes there's not a lot of surface water runoff. And, and, and you, okay, there is sorptivity and stuff, you know, there's infiltration processes. But what we often see is that in many, certainly smectite soils, and any soils that have any significant clay content, is you can get cracks. And these cracks, when they're open, are extremely permeable. And the cracks, when they're closed, are not very permeable. And so, in fact, what we see is a you know a five orders of magnitude decrease in permeability in those soils as they wet up. Okay, I don't see that in many textbooks. I don't see that in many papers, um, and yet it's dead obvious to any, anyone who thinks about it. Um, we are. I have to feel that we can, we're at the early stages experimentally. I think that our our and to some degree. The textbook theory has, um, has been unchallenged at a level which any serious physicist, if they were in a similarly complex system, would never allow. And, uh, and that's why we see, uh, you know, Jeff's wonderful work of digging a trench and watching what flows into it 
And that changes the whole conversation. Now, it's a little bit, I mean, not, I, and Jeff's work is fantastic, but I, I think Jeff would agree that this could have happened a while ago. And, uh, and I think that we really had, you know, we, we have to take stock of the fact that a shovel and, and hose um, are, are good friends and we need to, uh, to explore these things. So although we have nice theory and the textbooks are reasonably correct, things like the fingered flow, things like the crack flow, uh, the spill fill, and the dynamics therein of how cracks and, and spill fill and topography uh, are generated, interact, is like wide open stuff. And I, I really uh, encourage everyone to think about uh, how much they don't know rather than how much they do. Okay, thank John. Um, I, I open the floor to, the, uh, to you. Uh, yes, Jeff. It seems that in terms of theory um, with uh, this theme, that maybe the status quo is we think of hill slopes as a linear superposition of soil cores. That's kind of what hydrus is, right? Where uh, it's a simple additive system. And I think what the data from many groups is suggesting that there are things that uh, go way beyond that. And we could characterize in considerable detail a single point, but that may tell us very little, if anything, about the, the larger response at the, the hill slope scale. So I think somehow it, it, our, our, our uh, grappling with some of these issues has to recognize that that is a kind of a fundamental impediment to maybe, you know, realizing what John is pushing us towards. So, so you're you're uh, you're saying that uh, you need a paradigm shift in the descrip description of hill slope. I mean, we know we're talking to each other here. I know, but uh, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not that Hydrus doesn't have use in our, in our uh, toolkit. And I think that's a point maybe with all these methods that um, you know, any one method on its own is, is dangerous, but together maybe we kind of triangulate on truth. Okay. But yeah, I think we need, we need something that somehow embraces these uh, physics that aren't described in a Darcy Richards solver. Yeah. But you could also say that that's an ups it's conceptual upscaling rather than just simple upscaling. We have to, at these new scales, new things emerge. And, and that, is that what you're kind of saying? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yes. Experts in that area. Uh, you know, there have been a lot of uh, very recent work, extremely theoretical and very, you know, take the work of one as in MIT, you know, physical review and, phys and you know, fluid mechanics, etc. You know, and uh, with. Heterogeneity, heterogeneity is not the main issue. I mean, extremely controlled experiment with, with beads of perfect type of thing, you know. Finger flow in there. My question is the following. Is it important for us on how to deal with it in terms of ecohydrology? Meaning, when we go into doing the water balance equation of soil moisture at a point, say, in the simplest of the cases, we either use piston flow or use a bucket approach, okay? And uh, we know it's, it's fingering in there. Should we account for it? Does it have any importance to go into it with, and you know, get a headache with that, or we just get an aspirin and forget about it? Or should we do it when our main goal, say for some people, maybe, I'm not saying the, 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 the phenomenon is not important. Say, if my main goal is soil moisture balance equation, should I deal with it? And related to that, has anyone been uh, uh, tackled the problem of, you know, there has been a lot of work also in, in uh, root distribution, fine root distribution, okay? Has any work, theoretical work, has been based in the how should the plant explore the volume of ground, of the rain, on the basis of the infiltration is based on fingering? Those two right away. Okay, I, I think I think maybe maybe I uh, can cast it a little bit broader. Um, uh, I guess two parts. One is uh, what are the key physical processes that needs to be incorporated for understanding uh, uh, system function at the scale of interest. Uh, this is finger flow would be one of it, but uh, it's not the only process. Uh, or what to be the level of uh, complexity of models that are useful for understanding these systems. Is that fair to? Somebody would like to comment to that, uh, Christine? I, I think I have a similar point, um, but I'm gonna frame it a slightly different way. It, several of these talks 
really looked at the redistribution of flow, right? Crusting from, you know, the crust into the vegetated patches. You know, we see the same thing with Mark talking about um, redistribution of flow that gives you this riparian zone. We see that in Jeff's talk about these fill and still, spill areas. So we talk a lot about connectivity. Even with finger flow, we're talking about, you know, places that are connected and disconnected. But I think if our question is, what's the effect for the vegetation? In most cases, we argue that this kind of redistribution seems to increase vegetation water use, right? It certainly does in the crusting place. We, we saw that. We see that in riparian zones. But how much it does that really depends on how much of that the plant sees. And I think as, as a hydrologic modeler, I can model those things conceptually. But the thing I never know is how, how much does the plant see, which has a lot to do with how, what its rooting zone distribution looks like and the soil characteristics and how those are distributed over space. So as a modeler, what I would want from field experiments is a better characterization of that. And that's really hard to get, but I think it's the thing we most, one of the things we most need in all, that would fit a lot of these different questions. Okay. Uh, Eve? You wanted to say something? But yeah, to answer in part, I think, what Ignacio was saying. Please speak to the microphone. Oh, I thought I was. I'll go here so I can watch Ignacio at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> the, I think it, it depends on the problem you are trying to answer. There, there have been, for instance, uh, trying to revegetate very sandy, dry area, where, in fact, you use the finger flow to guide the roots at a great depth. Then, of course, you cannot ignore the finger flow. If there are other very, uh, say, Long Island is one of them. If you look at the pollution of the groundwater at great depth, and it's a very sandy aquifer, you have to look at, indeed, that conduit, that preferential flow that will bring the, the, the pollutant at great depth very quickly. Then you have to take it into account. But I agree with you in many cases, especially if it is not a very coarse sand, you can ignore it. My question, question, soil moisture balance equation, even with sandy flow. You know, I wouldn't go even to piston flow. The bucket oh. seems to work all right. Yeah. Should I worry or not worry about the fingers, which I agree is an important thing for many things. And secondly, should be a stress made in a study root distribution as the way the plant has to explore the volume of, of, of ground available to it. And in that case, I think it would be important to consider uh, uh, finger flow. Yeah. The, 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 when you said the piston flow, I, th I thought you were in fact saying as, as compared to using a more sophisticated description that may have nothing to do with uh, no, I want a very simple with description, finger. the bucket model, bucket model of the piston flow, which is yeah. generally how we base Yeah, and in most cases it will work very well. But you must be aware that this is a fairly crude sure. description, so that if there is something funny happening, you must look at whether that's because you simplified your model. But yeah, you, you, look, the simple, I quite agree with you, the simplest description is always the best if it works. Yeah, uh, if, if I, put, I put a slide here to tell us that uh, there is a level of complexity beyond which you don't get much uh, yeah. added value. Yeah. I'd like to, uh, to uh, um, divert the discussion a little bit to, uh, to uh, way forwards or what is missing a bit more uh, in uh, actionable terms if possible. <laughs> you know, like... Uh, if there was a single measurement to be made, which one would that be? And if there is a parameter that is missing, which one is the most critical one? And things like that, so, so it becomes clearer what actions need to be taken for the future. Amil Kare. Well, just very quickly, I think more than the water uh, balance equation, it's, it's probably a matter also of nutrients, uh, distribution of, uh, of nitrogen, uh, organic, uh, dissolved organic carbon, and all of that, that could be uh, studied also in terms of fingers or, or column models and, and, and th this could have more impact for eco-hydrology and patterns. Will it make a difference? Uh, 
Probably yes. In terms of export of nutrients, I think so. I don't know. That's my guess. Uh, Simon, Simon first, and then uh, um, uh, Jeff. Let's okay, go. I just would like to add something about uh, the, the sixty seconds or less. The right? importance of measurements. Uh, I think we have models that uh, can simulate some of uh, the mechanistic, in a mechanistic way, some of the dynamic uh, is lost scale at catchment scale and so on. But uh, what we really miss is uh, data for uh, confirming this uh, very colorful map we get uh, at the catchment scale. That's uh, something that is very difficult. We don't have data. We have point data, but we should find a way of uh, try to confirm or to test what we are producing uh, at a larger scale or simply as a sum of islop, I'm not saying uh, at 300 square kilometers. That's, I think, uh, it's important. Uh, I don't have uh, really an answer how to do that. I guess, uh, going back to your question, my game-changing measurement would be stream water resonance time. More difficult in arid and semi-arid regions, I realize, but uh, going back to Ignacio's question, I don't think you need those details of soil moisture. But if we're solving uh, a water balance and our stream water is 50 years old, I don't think we've confronted that issue. That is, we use a simple accounting model, but we don't, we don't account for inventory. And I think that will be a game-changing proposition for many of our watersheds where the water in the stream is many decades and we, we've not brought that into our thinking. And I think that will then, you know, speak to meal care's nutrient issues. Thank you. Uh, Scott? Uh, yeah, so, so as um, we focus on trying to get on to Christine's point uh, on the idea of what's the volume that we need to measure, one of the things we often forget about is when we're looking at this is what goes on b below the root zone. And, and we think about dry land areas. Well, on all these dry land areas, there are a few wet spots those wet spots are fed by whatever leaves the root zone. And those are actually perhaps more critical environmental areas than, than any of the other areas. So um, if it were me, I would, and, and there's also big pools of salinity, <coughs> excuse me, salinity and nitrogen in those deep beto zones that's waiting to move out as we change uh, uh, land use patterns. So a game changing measurement is something a little bit deeper below the root zone to look either there or in the springs and the streams that are coming out, as Jeff is saying, what's our effect on the, on the base flow? Thank you, Antonello. Uh, just to remind that in the soil plant atmosphere interactions, there is also the atmosphere, which has a lot of complex dynamics, including a, a very complex partial distribution of rainfall on very large scales. Uh, so in various measurements, we, we should not forget that, that part, I think. OK. Yes, Grant. So one, uh, in, a, in a way of thinking about ways forward, um, I'm struck by the fact that in the eco-hydrologic community, it seems as if the soil is dealt with almost like a kind of black box in the sense that we don't really know where, how it's distributed and plants sort of use it and roots kind of grow in it. But, uh, you know, I, my training and my, my background is mostly in geomorphology and within the geomorphic world, there's been a lot of work, new work on thinking about how soils development develop how they are distributed on hill slopes, how diffusive models of soil transport rearrange soils. And it seems to me that marrying some of this thinking that comes out of a different field with some of the questions that are arising in eco-hydrology would be a very fruitful area for, for future work. Thank you. What's next? Yeah, I, I'm not sure who... Uh, okay. So, so uh, um, I think that uh, we, uh, we talked a little bit about um, the soil, the hydro part. Uh, what, what, what about uh, the bio part, the plants, the management? You know, at some point that we brought here, uh, um, feedbacks, uh, things that are, uh, that makes the system so complex. Uh, well, I think that uh, allocation of carbon is quite unknown, so where to put it? Uh, so that's one of, one of the things, and also how um, this vegetation can adapt to uh, to different uh, pressures. So it's not just a constant thing, vegetation. Uh, so so if there was if there was uh, I don't know um, a grant for one million dollars to investigate a problem related to arid land ecohydrology, uh, 
what would be the top gap, the top topic that you know different people will come up with? Can anybody? Uh, Absolutely. Buying a helicopter, <laughs> I know that. Forget that. <laughs> no, no, we will just develop better models. You know, we'll figure out what to do with one million dollars. Don't worry about it. No, I'm not giving the million dollars yet. I need to have a good idea. Uh, it's almost irrelevant, but the ideas are. You know, we'll do model. <laughs> How do plants disable our ability to model flow in the subsurface? That's what uh, Biosphere 2 10-year experiment is all about. You have engineer hill slopes like cover systems on mines. They behave beautifully, just like the 2D finite element model said it would. You grow plants on it, and now they start to depart from that uh, expected behavior. I think that's a fundamental problem. What is it, our ignorance or what the plants are doing? Plants are introducing new physics that aren't accommodated in a Darcy Richards solver. Yes. I guess I would argue that, you know, I would give the million dollars to Jeff if what I cared about was the stream flow. But if what I cared about is the plants and how happy the plants are and how much carbon they're sequestering, I would ask for, you know, a bunch of money to give John Selker actually to come up with a cheap way to do sap flow everywhere, right? Because sap flow tells you when the plant is using water, right? When it's shutting down after it rains, it integrates over some sort of rooting zone, right? So if we had distributed sap flow, cheap sap flow measurements, I think we'd learn a lot about how plants function, right? If you care about the stream, I'd do what Jeff does. Thanks, Ignacio. Then I will put my million dollars in plant interactions and how to design a, how to design experiments or design an experiment that will tell me how the plants work in terms of water stress and water behavior and assimilation in, with a spatial interaction. We know very little about that. Even for the single plant, we still measure the water stress in a very simplistic manner. We have no idea really of how the plants, the different parts of the root, you know, parts of the root may be dry, parts of the root may be very wet. Do the parts that are wet work harder to fulfill maximum transpiration or not? Nobody has an answer to that question, a specific question, and has to be answered. And uh, now, how does the mixture of canopies and roots in a tree affect the work in the simulation of the tree when it is surrounded or not surrounded by other trees. The integration of the spatial structure of roots and canopies should be studied also in the field. We have some theoretical ideas how to do it via modeling, but there are almost no well-designed experiments in this area. Uh, I, would, I would actually challenge that because uh, I think uh, a large deal of what the agro uh, research used to do is exactly that to look at both the uh, comp role of competition on uh, plant for performance, uh, uh, different densities, and so on. So that it's not, I don't think it's entirely true to say that uh, there is no knowledge. You know, there is management of rooting zones to stress for, uh, for grapes and so on. But it's true that I don't think there was, n there was not enough in the, in the natural systems. Something That's probably, systems. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the biotic uh, processes are a bit, little bit overlooked. Establishment, uh, competition between species and, and li different life forms. There are some works, but, but I don't think that they are enough. So part of the million dollars should go there. Yes, Paul? Ah, okay. I think uh, um, you should give the million dollars to people who do research that this leads us to uh, some results that are not uh, um, too site specific. So, for example, if we uh, try to uh, do an analysis of uh, a big unknown, root distribution, what can you do with your million dollars? You can only uh, uh, dig out uh, a couple of forests and at best uh, know for that forest what the ratio is or uh, what about the bedrock depth? We can go there, d uh, dig, uh, and we will know that uh, that specific hillslope in a place that uh, somebody might care has a bedrock with that uh, 
So there are some things that I'm trying to say that will always remain unknown, and that will always be, uh, we, will not, uh, we just need to be aware of the fact that we need to deal with these unknowns, because it's, it's impossible to know about them. So it's much better to give a million dollars to the understanding of uh, some processes and how the plants, for example, interact with the physical environment. We should go and test some of these mechanisms of ecosystem engineering, for example, which are more transportable from a system to another. Thank you. Yes. Uh, just, just wait a second, if not. Okay. Now, uh, following what the first speaker was saying, I think there is a, a great amount of great lack of knowledge in uh, what are the carbon flow within the plant. We know a bit about uh, how uh, water is flowing through the plant, but we really don't know from a mechanistic point of view how this happening, uh, that the carbon goes to the different tissues that can grow the different tissues. And I think this is very important because at the end, uh, carbon assimilation and plant growth, they are not the same. Thanks. Gabi? Uh, perhaps to go back a little bit to the roots, there's been quite a bit of effort in the past uh, through manipulation experiments. So you give the system a little bit of a kick and you try to start, because the kicks are big perturbations. So by studying the transient phase, how the system adjusts, you might learn actually much more about the system than actually characterizing the system itself. Uh, for example, sp split root experiments have been one good example to study how the plant plumbing actually works. You know, are the different roots behaving independently or are they coupled? Are they talking to each other through some pressure gradients or not? So perhaps we haven't been thinking about manipulation experiments in an effective way to gain at what we to gain information about things we don't know. So we try to perturb them and see how they respond, rather than try to characterize just their natural state. So that's just one, one different set of experiments that could be done. Thanks, Gabi. Uh, if I was a graduate student now sitting in the room, like I see some of you, I would be quite depressed. <laughs> Seriously, because uh, I'm not hearing really a, a clear path of forward for what to do next. We hear complaints about what is not known and uh, you know yada yada, but it's really there is no clear path of action saying okay this is what we need to do next and here is why. So but you didn't give up the million dollars or what? Is that? Well, I'm still trying to get an idea to give the million dollars. Actually, Mark is writing the check right now. <laughs> my, uh, so so my comment is uh, uh, has two purposes. One is to be a bit provocative because I really don't you know I, I, it's kind of discouraging if, the, if we're not able to define some short-term and longer-term goals with some actionable uh, path. Uh, so that's one purpose. The other is to encourage the students to actually participate. Seriously, this is things that you'll be doing in the future and really you need to be part of this discussion. Obviously you see that the big names really have no idea what's going to happen in the future. <laughs> point is experiments because uh, controlled uh, laboratory experiments because uh, this is the, the only ultimate test of the uh, model predictions and uh, the question is how can uh, we scale ca how can we scale down the system both in space and time we know uh, other examples like sand dunes you can run experiments on the water and uh, the sand dunes uh, are, are comparable meter size, and you can uh, study uh, sentient dynamics uh, uh, in laboratory experiments. And uh, maybe there should be an interdisciplinary effort with plant scientists, not only ecologists, physicists, and ecologists, uh, to identify species uh, that allows uh, this scaling down. So, so you, you're suggesting that the way forward is to build teams that would identify model system, manipulative or, or investigable model system, then that will open the path to... Yeah, once, once this is done, there are many, many experiments can, that can be done and consume not one million dollars, but... Yeah, I'm sure we can do more, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Ronnie? <coughs> so I, I think that, uh, you know, you should not be frustrated. The bottom line is that it's a science that is still at, it, at its uh, infancy. And the reason that you do not get a clear answer from the audience 
is that depending on the science that you are tackling this big issue and the background of the people that are tackling that big issues, you have uh, hundreds of projects that can be subjected, that can be submitted. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, a million dollars is expended very uh, quickly. You know, it's only a year of my salary, for instance. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, the bottom line is that, you know, you have really, really a lot of, uh, a lot of research that is still needed. We still do not understand at the micro scale what's happening. We don't understand at the local scale. We don't understand at the regional scale. And we certainly do not understand at the global scale what's happening. When you combine with that the time scales of those processes, and you know for me right now the interest is looking globally at eco-hydrology and at the transfers of the species from uh, one continent to the other or from one area to the other and the impact, the long-term impact that that has on the climate system in which the eco-hydrology is only a component of it. You know, right there, I mean I can define with you Handwritten graduate students project for a PhD, easily. So, you know, you're asking for a question that is a very tough one, and there are so many issues that needs to be investigated from a modeling point of view, from a laboratory point of view, from a wind tunnel, from, you know, so that, that there is just not a simple answer. Yeah, that's clear. But uh, what would be uh, an answer to get started? Uh, Scott. I'll just carry on a little bit what Ronnie just said is that we have a tremendous number of experiments ongoing right now that are invasive species experiments, if you will, around the planet that are fundamentally changing the, the water dynamics of many semi-arid regions. And we simply should be looking at those. Those are experiments that are ongoing. People are a little bit, but in reality, you know, these are fundamental landscape changes that have gone on. Either humans have done it or the invasive species have come in. And what, what happens when an invasive species come in with respect to water? If you can tell me, you get the million dollars. Thanks. Jeff? I think a lot of this comes down to boundary conditions and how in the subsurface we don't know them. And that's what's uh, limiting our ability to do what our above ground counterparts maybe are better able to do. So going back to Gordon's point, I think we need to engage the geomorphological community, the soil science community to finally confront the distribution of this soil veneer in our environment. It goes back to the mid-60s when Hewlett looked at uh, watersheds up and down the eastern seaboard and ranked soil depth and its distribution as the number one factor. We've heard that come up in yeah. a multitude of presentations this week, mm -hmm. but we've not confronted that one. You know, one of the things that, that, that strikes me, we, we've heard that this field is in its infancy, and I actually don't quite agree with that. I mean, we've been at this for over 100 years uh, with uh, you know, agricultural and eco-hydrology. What strikes me is I think we need to look at our strategies for collaborative research. You know, what we, we're, we're good at individual projects. We're, good, we, we, we're kind of medium lousy at, at multi-investigator multi projects. And uh, Scott and I have been running a little center we called CTEMPS. Uh, you can look that up. But one of the things that struck me is we, we bring in an instrumentation and, and, and help people make measurements. And it's been absolutely mind-boggling how successful some of these projects have been to me. I, it, when you step in with, a, with a, a key technology and a key support, and I think that one of the ways that we can really make more advancements than we are is thinking much more creatively and economically about how we work together and how we collaborate. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for much more efficiency compared to doing all these experiments at many, many locations, none of which reach a critical mass, and then which many are like flowers that bloom and fade too quickly instead of having the, uh, the continuity by way of databases and other structures that would make them something that people could build on. Yes, Gary. I think it's well recognized in many sciences that uh, if you have a clear identity of the questions, and you have clear hypotheses that if you do an experiment, you could eliminate certain possibilities and then engage in another possibility. The progress is very rapid. I mean, that, that's well established. We are not at that phase. I don't think we agree on all the questions. You see it. You know, are we interested in the soils? Are we interested yeah, in the plants? The so so are we interested in the entire system? So I don't think we have this, the level of maturity yet to ask these questions that can then yield themselves to definite experiments that will filter out hypotheses. Is this happening or that happening? by a single experiment. I, I don't think we are at that level. And, and perhaps it's just the nature of the field. But, but 
Is it something that uh, requires that uh, we build a jargon or some uh, platform for, uh, for communicating uh, the knowledge gaps and the knowledge needs as a first step, or is it a waste of time? Because this is exactly what we're trying to do here, if you notice. I think the questions have to be first asked. What, what are the critical questions? You know, that's basically it. If, if you are able to agree on the questions, then I think we are able to start thinking about the experiments and the models and everything. Let me pose a question related to that, but somewhat different. You know, we talk a lot about the scales. How about if the scales is not an issue in many problems of hydrology? And this may seem, you know, a terrible thing to say. But when you have a fractal structure, and river basins are fractal, we all agree, and I think we all agree on that, the drainage structure anyway, the meaning of that is the lack of a characteristic scale. A sub-basin is identical on its geomorphological properties of the network to the total basin. You cannot say it is a sub-basin if you don't give a scale. Okay, that's the term of fractality. If that is the case in the geomorphological structure of the drainage network, is it an heresy to think that the hydrologic dynamics responsible for that lack of characteristic scale, which is what the fractal is all about, is also in operation, meaning, for example, that energy transformations at the sub-basin scale, I'm not talking here about other areas, it's sub-basin, river basin, which are very crucial for hydrologists, that the energy transformation that takes place at the sub-basin scale, at the basin scale, at whatever scale are there, are the same, basically. That there is a random variation among them, sure. Fractals are statistical, well, they are deterministic fractals, but in general, statistical fractals. So, if that is the case, the focus to tackle this type of question is somewhat different, because you start with a hypothesis, which I agree with Gabby, you start with a hypothesis and try to see if it's true. It may be, it may be, as a hypothesis, that the characteristic transformation of energy inside of a basin are independent of the size of the basin, meaning per unit area, the metabolic rate of the basin, meaning the energy transformation that takes place to give from rainfall water, blue water, or green metabolism, biomass, are statistically the same. That has not been tested, but I think it's an, a, an important hypothesis to entertain. It will simplify a heck of a lot of our lives. People tend to think fractals are very complicated. On the contrary, fractals are very simple things in the sense that they lack characteristic scales. Yeah. So, so, uh, so uh, Ignacio, <coughs> maybe it's correct, but does it give us any new insights about the process? It's like thermodynamics. I said it yesterday. It doesn't tell you what to do. It just tells you what you cannot do. How fractal are going to tell me how things are happening? Baloney. It nah. tells you a lot of what to do, my friend. <laughs> when you have a characteristic law, quotations in the world law, relationship, independent of a characteristic scale, it tells you a lot of things that to do. Simplify your law. You only have to, you only have to position where it is. But if, I can, if, if you can entertain the proposition that transpiration per unit area at a sub-basin, average of our also basin of the same topological magnitude is a constant in a basin. That's a heck of a thing for practical applications. Okay, somebody here help me. <laughs> Danny, yeah, no, I don't I, agree with you that thermodynamics doesn't tell you what, on, that only tells you what, what you can't do, right? It, 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 no, no. <laughs> no, it's just because we were at the point where we were in non-equilibrium. Uh, but as soon as thermodynamics gets us how to describe non-equilibrium processes, we'll be able to get that. Uh, you know, uh, Ignacio, okay, so Ignacio, uh, imagine a street like Beresheva, a city map that looks like a percolation. Would you drive from one side of the city to the other based on percolation theory? Yeah, you, of course. And on average, you'll be fine, but on average, you also will be uh, hitting a wall, right? 
I, so, I mean, I'm first thing is, are you sure you have a percolation? Well, system? yeah, I think so. Oh, really? I'm Why? as sure as that as you are sure that the basin is fractal. <laughs> no, I am more sure of that because I have the evidence. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I cannot. I, I really don't know how to answer that. No, to no. be honest, uh, uh, Danny, but uh, but. Uh, I do think that we have to entertain this type of questions, and, and, and uh, you see, it's, uh, it's, um, what Amirka said right now is, 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 is absolutely correct, too. You know, we tend to think of thermodynamics as a very vague, you know, in the clouds type of thing. It's the science of energy transformation. Yeah. What takes place in the basins are energy transformation. We are far, and physicists, physicists in fact, are far from thermodynamic of open, non far from equilibrium type of systems, far. Okay, but that doesn't imply that we already have some signatures of what is going on. For example, if you have a power law, if you have a power law in clusters of trees in a savanna, that's a fractal structure. Now we can argue if it's a power law or not. But in case you say, okay, no, I have here four orders of log scale, that's a fractal structure, like it or not, it's a fractal. And that immediately implies for you a lot of very important things of what's going on. I and I think we have to entertain that because it will simplify our life. It will not complicate it. I think, I think Danny, that, I mean, what Ignacio is, has put forward is, is an excellent response to a Gabby um, challenge, which is a question, a hypothesis. And, and whether it's, it, it, it's going to be, you know, explanatory in all contexts, absolutely not. But I think it is a point that we, as a community, when we see things that, that we don't understand, Stating them very crisply, stating questions very crisply is the first step to retaining progress. And I think that um, we are, we're tempted sometimes to oversell what we know. And, and for instance, you know, the modeling of these complex patterns. And it would be much more fun if we said, wait a minute, there's two competing model, two competing opportunities here. Is it X? Is it Y? Is it surface tension? Is it plant root distribution? And start to, to come up with some simple questions and, and then you can generate simple experiments. Fair enough. Uh, uh, the, just to, uh, to bring back the discussion to, some, uh, to, uh, broader, to the broader group here, uh, I'll just finish with a comment to Ignacio. Uh, I'm all, in, for, uh, I'm all for in favor of, uh, of uh, general laws. They are very useful. We use them all the time in porous media, in understanding systems that are very complex. If they, of course, if, uh, uh, whenever they're applicable and, you know, uh, I'd be very happy if, uh, if the power law basins, uh, energy consumption, uh, transpiration, all obey this uh, metabolic laws or similar to metabolic laws. This is fine. The, the question is, do you think, or does anybody in the audience think that, uh, is this the, uh, where we put all our eggs in the future of the research in this area? I, no, I, I, wouldn't, no, I wouldn't put all, all the eggs in any basket. So, okay, so what, what other baskets do we have? Yes, Gordon. So I, I want to go back to John's uh, turning to the graduate students in the room, and, and, and I too am thinking, wondering what they're thinking, listening to this. And it, it seems to me that, we, you know, that on, on one hand, there are these big unanswered theoretical questions, which, which are of fundamental importance for this, from the standpoint of the science. But I think as Sally brought up this morning, uh, you know, we're, we're entering, we're already in an age where things are changing very rapidly. We all know this for a whole bunch of reasons. And the ability to predict the direction of change, uh, how quickly things will change, and whether we can do anything about change that we don't like, um, and as it relates to things we care about, like water, like plants, like soil, seems to me to be absolutely fundamental. It puts something like eco-hydrology very much in the forefront of, of things we need to, to be able to say something about. So when I think about moving forward, it seems to me that being able to, to orient ourselves to making, being able to make predictions about how if the, wa if the temperature precipitation field changes, what are the plants going to do? How is that going to affect the feedbacks onto water, to soil development, and so forth? I mean, we can all fill in the, in the blanks here, but I, I think that using that as a framework and then within that asking some of these more fundamental questions uh, becomes a, a, a reasonable sort of 
strategy, at least, for organizing a scientific enterprise. Thanks, Gordon. Any graduate student is going to respond to the challenge? Yeah. I won't be a graduate student, but I will. I thought what Gordon just said was very, very sensible, and it might be worthwhile noting that the upcoming decade for the International Association of Hydrologic Sciences is focused on exactly this issue of predictions in the context of changing systems. If we think about change occurring as a function of a changing climate, it's very clear that as hydrologists, we tend to focus first on precipitation. If we then take a longer view of that and say, well, jeepers, we can saving Ronnie's presence, maybe make some kind of a forecast on century, decadal to century scales, and we ask ourselves what are the modes of change that will impact the watersheds and the landscapes we care about on those time scales, we know for sure that vegetation can change on those time scales. And therefore, if we really care about trying to do something and make some planning for this coming period of accelerated change due to human activity, we'd better have some eco-hydrologists thinking about that. I think these are very important questions and very important comments, but we should be aware that they are not new questions and they've been around already for at least 20 years. But uh, are still important questions that we can keep in mind and uh, are of higher priority than many others. Yes. Mr. Jeff. I'm not so depressed. Yesterday in the morning, I heard some of the best presentations I've heard in a long, long time. You know, coevolution of plants and their environment. And uh, you know, if research is to see what everyone else has seen and no one else has thought, I, I think we saw that uh, in a pretty impressive way uh, yesterday. So I don't know. Somehow I see this as uh, going after issues of coevolution of plants, soil, atmosphere, rocks. Uh, that interdisciplinary mix is very fertile and what seems like heterogeneity now to a hydrologist I think ultimately will be learning about uh, how those interactions give rise to what seems now heterogeneity but uh, we may be, I hope we're embracing heterogeneity going down the road because that is the end result of that co-evolution. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I one thing I saw here the last couple of days is I saw some amazing results from, from people who've been working on these long-term ecological research facilities, both here in Israel as well as in North America. A, a few people have worked with those well, and I think a lot of us probably have, have not or not taken advantage of them. Uh, those still exist, and those are very ripe areas. And then, at least in North America, we have this whole network called the National Ecological Observing Network, which is being built across the U.S. And, and I don't, I, can I see anybody who's involved with that? No, Neon. neon. No. Okay, so we have one. Um, I think we probably need to be involved, the students need to be involved in those activities because those are monitoring long-term changes in ecosystems uh, from the biological side and, and uh, we can bring in the expertise in hydrology and we're not there. So I'd say we should do that. How? Um, visit your local neon representative, which, Cong which there your are. Your neon congressman? Uh, no, just visit. Uh, th these people are available. Go on the web. You'll see who's in your region. I think there's 14 or 15 biological biomes. Who's running it? Be proactive. We have to be proactive because if we're not, we will just tag along on the side. Uh, before I give it to uh, Ignacio, just a comment. Is this, is this a matter of... Uh, of uh, disciplinary boundaries that we have uh, ecologists and hydrologists and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, physicists not talking to each other? Uh, well, perhaps, or at least in the case of, of NEON, the ecologists certainly spoke with one voice to build the network. Well, and ra raise the questions. But in that point precisely, it was, I, wasn't refer I am an optimist like Jeff is. And one of the great things that I have seen in ecohydrology and hydrology in general is Look at years, years ago, you know, you know, when some of us had black hair. Hydrology was a very, you know, close in itself type of community. And, you know, in that sense, I am very happy we have come a long way. And ecohydrology has come a long way. You see now ecologists and hydrologists working together, but very much together. I mean, as partners in research, 
physics, with physicists and mathematicians, which, you know, you see publications of the ecological community, you know, in all kind of journals, let it be science, nature, or physical review letters, or what resources research, that's a sign of maturity. That's a sign we are going in the right way. That, I mean, we, I don't think we are close, we, we, you know, we, I think we have grown to, to a lot of interaction. I think the new generation of graduate students will be, will be benefiting from that enormously, enormously. Years ago, I wasn't thinking about, to, you know, for if somebody doing a PhD in hydrology, having a co-advisor in physics or in, in mathematics, you know, that now is very, very common here in Israel and in other countries too. And I think I, that's a, a very good reason to be extremely optimistic because it's a sign of a, of a science that is progressing fast. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I feel about um, a bit uh, outsider. Uh, I never work on hydrology related uh, questions and uh, uh, not uh, that, that they are not important, but um, if, uh, if I would uh, try to uh, contribute to make an input here, I, uh, obviously I would say that um, more biology and uh, and mechanistic approach are needed, but I think I, I would like to try something at, at uh, another level. And this relates to more um, uh, fundamental questions that, uh, that I think, that I feel that are not yet being answered or challenged, maybe because it's too ambitious and we need to be humble in our, but, but I think we still need to be humble in our, in our sh short-term goals, but see the ambitious long-term goals and try to get better understanding of big questions. So uh, I have two questions that are related to what Ignacio said uh, earlier this morning. What he said is that uh, the difference between mechanisms and, and why, for me, it's the difference between proximate mechanism and ultimate mechanisms. And uh, so for the proximate mechanism, uh, I'm not uh, very afraid of the, of the, of the general concept of, of complexity. Everything is so complex, but, but not every details matter the same. And I want to ask this, this uh, community, do you know what, what are the key elements or the key drivers that drive whatever you want to study, uh, vegetation dynamics in arid land systems? Can you run, can you do sensitivity analysis of, of this long list of influential factors and rank them? Which one are more, more important than others under, under different circumstances and conditions which, which uh, play a different role? So I, I don't know if you are there, I, I know that, that in many ecological systems this is a key question and, and people are striving to get this understanding. And another for this, the why, the, the ultimate reasons is that to look from evolutionary perspective on, on the life, on, on the plants and animals that are involved with this, with this system and ask what traits they, they develop. Why the cyanobacteria are like that? Why the plants have these, these features for disposal, for competition, and why the animals are so uh, these are very big questions, and they are not too ambitious, I think. And, uh, and uh, I, I would set that as a, as a goal and, 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 and combine models with empirical uh, work in mostly in a mechanistic approach and not in pattern uh, description approach. And uh, this is what uh, I think is worth the one million or more. Yeah, it, it would be if it was less vague. <laughs> because typically the resource that most matters is the one that is uh, most limiting. It's very easy. The question is how to identify when and, uh, and to what extent. Uh, but uh, still, I think, the, I think that um, my sense, you know, I said that uh, it's depressing because uh, uh, to provoke a little bit, but. Uh, the, what's missing, I think, is, um, is um, somebody proposing uh, forward some, you know, so I would say something, let's build teams that will systematically explore the uh, uh, experimental systems and extract from them whatever there is to be known about. Okay, so that sounds to me, uh, uh, others have mentioned, I think Scott mentioned that let's get involved more in um, uh, long-term uh, ecological observatories 
and uh, either shape them or use the data more efficiently. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Um, I think I'm summarizing here a little bit. Uh, Jeff, uh, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, there are some, you know, you pointed out to some key variables in your view. I didn't see much traction, by the way, by the uh, bio community. It would be very interesting to hear what the bio people think are the key variables. So I think Ignacio and uh, Paolo and uh, um, Emil Carre mentioned roots, plants uh, in general, but other, other things that are at a larger scale that matter, like, uh, I don't know, composition of community or, or um, you know, we heard talks about dispersion yesterday. I mean, are they variables that are key and we are not addressing them? Am I going to beat a dead horse if you guys have no... <laughs> I'm sorry, I was a bit late uh, in the discussion. Yeah, it might. <laughs> but uh, when I look at the discussion here, or when I listen to the discussion and look at the slide, I'm, I'm missing uh, uh, adaptation. Because if you have a changing world, then of course it's very important to, to, to measure or to, to notice the, the rate of change. And whether the systems that we study, whether it be pattern systems or plants in a changing environment, whether they can keep up with that, with that change and adapt and still function the, the way that they do. So I think that uh, adaptation is a, well, almost unavoidable thing to study in the next uh, decade. So, so just elaborate a bit, what do you mean study adaptation? Give, it, give us example, concrete example somebody can well, follow. A concrete example, which is my hobby, hobby horse, of course, <laughs> is those pattern systems, right? Uh, they can collapse, right? And then Ehud comes in and he said, well, it's not that bad because it goes stepwise, right? Well, that could be the case, but it could also be if the rate of change is too fast to keep track of those steps, the system collapses anyway. And those kind of questions, and also on the level of the plants, how plants can adapt to uh, increasing CO2, for example, is also a fundamental uh, question which has implications on larger scales, obviously. That's what that's Gordon mentioned that, uh, yeah. yeah. A uh, closely related question is the uh, uh, question of biodiversity. I mean, it, um, it may happen on uh, much shorter scales than adaptation. That there, are, there are many, many species uh, uh, in the system, but with the few ones that are dominant for given environmental conditions with climate change, other species may show up and, they may, and, they so the, and change the community st structure. And this is uh, one of the uh, 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 reasons why uh, studies of biodiversity are, are that important. I didn't hear uh, much uh, traction to the idea of, uh, Gabi, of uh, manipulative experiments. I mean, do you, uh, do you envision uh, in some of these semi-natural systems that people will actually carry out, you know, enrichment or some other manipulative experiments that, to check some of the concepts? I mean, to me, that would be the big, if you really want to understand what's going to happen to a system under elevated atmospheric CO2, that's the experiment. Well, phase, to, uh, phase uh, arid is not going to happen, I think. Uh. For example, warming, you know, whatever you decide, and the processes that you would be looking for in certain cases, maybe seed production, in other cases, maybe photosynthesis. I think it depends on what the experiment is trying to answer. But you, get, you gain much more from those manipulative experiments. Antonio? Just on, on, on this matter, in Europe there is a big European project which is called ANAI, which is exactly on manipulative experiments in ecosystems. And then uh, there is the, all the system of ecotrons in France, which is exactly for that. And they are also coping with arid ecosystems and doing, well, not everything of course, but the idea is very powerful. And that is doing experiments, not observations. Thank you. Yes, Simone. Following uh, on the same uh, topic, I think uh, there are a series of experiment of manipulation experiments, especially from uh, the ec ecological community that they carry out in the last uh, 10 years, not only for CO2 enrichment. Yeah, yeah. What is missing, in my opinion, is testing models versus this experiment. There are very, very few studies that test models against manipulation experiment. Uh, it's too easy to test the model for uh, the natural condition, but if the same model with uh, similar parameterization, or same parameterization is working for uh, uh, let's say boundary condition of the natural system is working also for the manipulation. That's uh, give uh, much more weight to the predictive power of the model. Who, who writes this? 
Yeah, please. Uh, I would say, at the very least, regarding uh, comparing models to uh, to experiments, is to uh, try to test uh, some of the assumptions behind the models, which is definitely the first rule of a model is it only uh, works within the within the assumptions. To uh, so to test some of the uh, assumptions asserted. Uh, in the models, and there are various assumptions for uh, various models that can be tested. I don't know. So, uh, for instance, uh, talking about a uh, global uh, global competition versus uh, local uh, local facilitation, and other things that that are within the models at least stand behind the uh, stand behind the pattern formation, and uh, could be tested experimentally. Well, uh, you know, one of the points I made with respect to the, the a lot of our toy models. Mm -hmm is uh, doing a manipulative experiments that would check these patterns. For instance, we used shade cloths, and you could buy shade cloths very cheaply and all of a sudden cut the energy in half. You can uh, change the, the water that falls on a site. You can change the surface tension of the, of the site. You can um, add clay-sized particles. You can do a whole lot of things that would then if, uh, test some of these fundamental processes that you guys have, that, that are incorporated in models and see if they are responsive. And, I, and so I, I'm not sure that we need to change, we need to check for global climate change parameters especially. I think it, it just needs to be that you have a pattern and you, 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 you kick it and you try, different, you, you try the key parameters that you think are in control and see what you get. And I know these are slow systems, some of them, but um, some of them are not so slow. You can also find faster ones. I guess uh, I'd like to ask if, uh, if there is a role to technology to enhancing and facilitating this, uh, this uh, what appears to be an observational gap or, or experimental gap. Um, what, what? Hmm? I'll address that tomorrow. You'll address that tomorrow? Okay. Any more so comments? Then, yes, Gabby? One, one more comment. I mean, if, if you want big, ambitious yes, research absolutely. agendas, I mean, the study of collapse of complex systems would be perhaps the most appropriate given the fact that we are seeing rapid change, and so how does a complex system collapse in general, whether it be it human, biotic, abiotic interactions between them. At the fundamental level, there may be lots of commonalities between many systems, so perhaps studying the generic complex system as is, how it might, what fingerprints it might reveal as it goes through perhaps a rapid transformation or a collapse is, is a common theme that has popped up many times. So perhaps a general theory, to try to go for a general theory that predicts that, or at least describes that mathematically, would be, at least on the theoretical side, would be desirable. How, how it is achieved, I don't know, but that would be desirable. The other thing is that if you want a big monitoring initiative, if some of the variables can be monitored, or at least designed for the future space experiments or future satellite experiments, what would you be gauging at the planetary scale? Why should we send more telecommunication satellites when we should be perhaps monitoring seismic activity or groundwater resources or something like that. So, so these would be the sort of big challenges I think needs, that needs to be confronted. But if you have that theory nailed down and you know what you're looking for, then you know what, what the data set will tell you in terms of approaching a, a catastrophic shift or, or avoidance. So, so this would be the big challenge, I think. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, for collapse of complex systems, there are some quite theories. Uh, sort of, you there are toy models. <laughs> <laughs> there are many models, that's true. There are toy models, and we leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Yes? So, uh, I think uh, we also need to be careful when we say that uh, uh, there are no observations. Of, that there is, uh, of course, there is a need for more observations. Or more, uh, but. Uh, uh, it seems that as if uh, the community had not done anything up to this point. Manipulative experiments is something that ecologists have been doing for uh, since ever. So, and uh, so perhaps uh, it's not a new thing. Perhaps uh, there is still uh, more that can be done in the direction. But uh, it seems as if uh, uh, new experiments were, were the only new thing we need to do uh, to advance the field. Well, I agree with Gabi. Just uh, uh, an understanding also of fundamental. Uh, or the development of a uh, fundamental theory of how the systems uh, uh, may respond uh, or may collapse, that's really, uh, that's probably mm, newer than uh, many uh, do. For example, the comment on soils. Of course, that's, uh, I think the community, hydrological community, is already connected with the soil science community. So that's uh, um, not something that uh, has not been done so far. Yeah, I mean, I heard the request from the uh, hydrology community, the plant community, to give information 
or to find ways to describe root exploration, volumes, maybe uh, other issues related to the plants. Are there similar requests from the plant community to the quote-unquote physical or hydrological communities for variables or understandings or processes that are sorely missed but are not yet resolved? Yes, maybe just one point. Um, uh, here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, hydrologists always have uh, this heterogeneity in there, and I'm always confused, is it a heterogeneity problem or a mechanistic problem? And um, uh, for me it would be helpful if they could indicate which, which of the two it is and when. What, in the uh, in description of... Uh, Parameterization or in description of uh, of how uh, water will flow through the uh, through the soil. So is it uh, is it an heterogeneity problem or is, or is it really the fundamentals that we do not understand? Okay. The last chance for students to comment. Seriously. It's really. Um, it's yeah, I saw that. I saw that. It was very nice. But I think there are other students who can have opinions. It's after all the future. Yes. Um, I think one thing that I kind of miss in uh, hydroecology ecology is that every uh, measurement method is so complicated. So if we could have a few, if we could come up with measurement methods that might be uh, slightly less reliable but a little bit less complicated, it would be easier to do large-scale experiments or to use methods from a different discipline in our experiments in instead of always digging deeper maybe finding ways to um, get easier measurements it's a good point more geophysics I'll say right yes Christine. can I respond to that with like a, an alternative model which is that yes, I agree that a lot of these measurements are really complex to make and some people are really good at it. And I see the same thing with models, right? To develop really good models of coupled hydroecology is complex and takes time. And I think part of what we still need is doing synthesis better so that if you want something measured, you can very easily go and get that measured by someone who has that expertise or similarly with modeling. And so I kind of want to go back to, you know, it's simple to say we need to develop teams, but I think we, we could think very strategically about what those teams should look like and how they should function. And because I think a lot of the problem, um, you know, there are all these field experiments and there are models that could use those field experiments to test assumptions, but it's not brought together in the right way. So I think teams that could do synthesis and provide services could measure stuff for you when you need it measured would help. Okay, I think uh, we have to bring this uh, discussion to a closure. Thank you all for participating. Uh, what will follow now is the um, poster session. Are we going to take uh, some time off or is it? So we'll take a 10 minute break and then we'll uh, reconvene here for the poster session. Yes, thank you very much.